before to present them. Um, apologies. As you know, the session is now being recorded um, and that will be posted on Tableau's YouTube channel tomorrow. So if you do have to drop off for any reason um, and you want to catch up at a later date, you will be able to do so. Um, equally, if you want to share this with um, some people in your team or you know, other people at your organization, then you can do that as well. We're always looking for new speakers to present. Um, we dive into the Tableau community quite a lot to source our speakers, but with a lot of people attend these events and we'd like to hear um, you know, some people's use cases in the workplace for Tableau Prep. Of course, sometimes you might have to mask the data or you might not be able to go into the full detail, but we really encourage new speakers to come along, even if you're just getting started on your Tableau Prep journey. A lot of the people at the user group are in the same boat as you. Um, so I think having someone that's, you know, just kicking their journey off is really encouraging to see because it will, you know, bring others to the stage as well. Um, so if you are interested in signing up, you can go to that link till.bi forward slash prep sign up. Um, I'll put that in the Q&A or chat um, in a second or Jenny, if you could, that would be great. And then the last thing I want to cover before we um, dive into Carl and his session on parameters and tiling is we've been running this user group for two years now. Um, and obviously everyone is familiar with Zoom and that virtual uh, workspace. However, there is another platform that we can use for the user groups. Um, this is called Remo. Some of you may be familiar with this from other Tableau user groups. Um, they use it quite a lot, but this still allows for people to present to the group, ask questions, all the same things you have with Zoom. However, there's a virtual networking side to things. So you sit on individual tables and when people aren't presenting, you can chat to the sort of four, five, six other people that are on your table. You can get up and move to another table. Um, and it brings back that proper user group feel to the event. So I'm just gonna put a poll out there now to see if people would be interested in that. So you can meet some other like-minded preppers um, and it just gives a slightly different feel to the user group. So I'm just gonna launch this now and hopefully you should be able to attend yes or no. Okay. So there is an interest there. Um, we'll look at getting one of those set up in the future um, because it's a nice way to, you know, meet other people in the community. Um, some, you know, you might meet someone who's far um, more advanced with Tableau Prep than you are and you can ask some questions. You might make some new friends along the way as well. So um, we'll look at setting up that up in the future, but um, we'll press on with the user group now. So. We have two speakers today. Uh, we've got Carl and we've got Will. Um, Carl has presented, I think, this is the third time um, at the user group, so a regular, is that right? Yeah. Um, so Carl's gonna be talking about some of the um, more recently released features of Tableau Prep. So we're looking at parameters and tiling. And Will will be on in just a bit to talk about um, how data preparation and Tableau Prep can help improve your visualizations. Um, so, Carl, if you would like to take the stage, um, go from there. Cool. If you do have any questions for the speakers um, throughout, just pop them in the Q&A and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. Thanks. I think, Jack, you're going to have to stop sharing to allow me to share, I believe. There you go. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I didn't really know how to start this session because this session for me feels a little bit like why I do quite a lot of the things I do. Because I'm kind of living in this world where I got stuck into prep really early on that originally uh, the program was called Maestro, uh, which and kind of explains why the actual server product's called Conductor. But I've, I've kind of had this love-hate relationship with prep. I absolutely love what it offers in so many ways, but I had this little moment of hate, which is weird to say at the start of a prep user group. Um, and that moment of hate is, how fast the devs <laughs> keep updating the product. 
that um, I've written a book about Tableau Prep. I'm the Zen master. I focus quite a lot on Tableau Prep, even though I still do lots on the visualization side of things and teaching side. But I kind of have this little moment of just, oh, I'm trying to remember how to do all of these different things and, and keep up to date with all of it. And some of the ways that I've tried to do that is along with Jenny um, and Tom Prowse and Jonathan Allenby originally is run the Prep and Data Weekly Challenges that if you've attended any of these user groups before, you'll, you'll absolutely come across. That we wanted to do the challenges to basically allow people to try and, and work their way through learning these skills, getting to use those new features, but trying to stay abreast of those new features was, was quite tough. And, and actually that's what led to this other chunk of content on, on the Prep and Data site, which actually went into forming the book, was all of these kind of different different techniques and skills that you actually needed to be able to use the tool because it is different from visualization as I'm sure all of you are familiar with or getting familiar if you're newer into your the kind of prep journey but we're kind of in this world where yeah that, that pace of innovation that fact that it's monthly rather than quarterly like the rest of Tableau becomes quite a challenge just to kind of keep going with and actually by the time I even finished the book I and kind of start to create a website to, to help with that, I realized that I needed to keep the how-to post going because we just had more and more either great techniques coming through. So one of Jonathan Allenby's techniques on how to piece together um, more common separated strings where you've got different numbers of valuables, variables, sorry, within there, or even the new features as Jack mentions, like tiles that I'll go through today, um, parameters on half finished a blog post on, I need to finish that off. And I'll get that up onto the site. So you'll see that on the prepandate.com site rather than the old blogspots. We're trying to migrate more content over there, but we're still left all of the challenges on the blogspot site. So when when Jack mentions, um, go on, we'll have you back for the third time, what would you like to talk about? My mind went straight to, hang on, what's happened recently within prep? And I realized there have been quite a lot of things that have happened rapidly. So I, I thought I'd go and look at a prep flow that would actually go and help us kind of just address some of those things that have come in pretty rapidly. Um, so these data sets are taken from a few prep and data challenges. I've, I've altered one of them a little bit by adding a date in to one of the early weeks of this year uh, for, for the main chunk. I'm going to look at tiles and parameters if you want to, if you want to kind of pick this up and follow along the video down the line. I think it was week three of 2022. Jenny can probably drop that into the chat as she sees this data set pop up. Um, but then we've also got a, a new growth functionality, which, which we did a challenge for or towards the end of, of last year. And the new additions are great, but they're starting to drop into different places within the tool. So if you haven't downloaded 2021.4, you might not get this little button at the top of the screen. I'll come back and talk about parameters a little bit later. But also you might notice within the super steps, so these kind of top level elements that one of the more recent parts that we're looking at is we've got this new rows functionality. So new rows, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit towards the end as that was from a, from a couple of versions ago now, but I don't think many people have ha either had the chance to use it because you've got to have the right data set and the, the right chance to dig into it. So I just thought, let's take a step back. Let's go through some of those recent changes where you might start to find value in, in diving into these. Uh, we can go through a few of those. So like any good prep flow, um, we're gonna start with a clean step just to go and look at what data we've actually got. So this is data from our new fake organization. We like uh, fake businesses and organizations in the prep and data challenges. Originally we had Chin and Bid, Suds Co. Then um, we had Prep Air, our airline, and then we created, who was third? All Chains, our, our bike store. And it finally felt like we needed a non-business. So we, we created the Prep School. So what we have within this data set is a thousand student IDs. You can go and see that very nicely within the profile pane. You can see that we've got a whole load of different grades and, and kind of scores for all of the different subjects. And we've got a date that grade was given. You can see that in the detail pane below. And we can go and see the profile of those grades as we go through. I still love that overall look and feel of prep and it helped me explore the data set before I even kind of start to do anything. But this data structure isn't great. So hopefully you've, you've noticed before some of our standard steps are still absolutely key to what we do, whether it's aggregating, prepping, uh, pivoting or pulling multiple data sources together. 
So if I just go and pivot and let's go and change the shape of this data to just have one column for all of my subjects. And we'll also have one column for all of our scores. That's going to make some of the work that we do with tiling and with parameters a little bit easier to go and control that. And, and ultimately what we're using prep for is to go and create that nice, clean analytical data set. Still with anything that I do within prep, you'll see me dropping in lots of clean steps into what I do. It helps me go and see that prep's done exactly what I want it to do. So it makes my life so much easier by being able to see the data both in terms of profile, but also in terms of that detail underneath if you are newer to prep. So we've got a nice cleaner data structure that will allow me to start showing you some of these new shiny features of what we've got kicking around. So let's handle parameters first. I just want to know whether my students go and actually hit a score that makes sense, that, that meet that target of what I'm trying to set for them. But actually, what should that target score be for whether a student passes or fails a subject? Well, if I go and create not a new row step, so I still have a miss, miss click. If I go and create a new clean step, you'll go and find this ability to go and create parameters, not in the places you think lots of the things that you'll go and find in terms of the rich functionality of prep are hidden either within the ellipsis menu, within the profile pane, or just by right clicking in different places on the screen or seeing that the toolbar at the top of our profile pane. Parameters, because they work across all of our data sources and across our flow, they're actually up at this top menu bar. So where we have our run all flows, where we're going actually refreshing the data, pausing those data connections if we need to, if we're doing some complex things, we don't want prep to continually update as we go and work with that. Parameters is lurking up at the top. So it's this icon, three lines, it almost feels like a guitar chord in my head um, when I look at that icon. But if you click on it, it's gonna tell you what a parameter is and also how to go and create one. This dialog box is a little bit different from what we see within desktop um, and within web edit within the server environments, which is a little bit different for, for where we kind of live within most of the things within Tableau Prep mimic what we see within desktop. Some of the others like visual analytics or the analytical calcs, I'll, I'll dive into a little bit later. So let me set up a name for this first of all, so I know what we're actually looking at. It's gonna be our passing grade. I can set up a description. I'll come back to why that might be useful a little bit later. But with this first iteration of parameters, we haven't got all of the data types. You'll notice that dates and date time don't exist within here. But we do have the ability to go and set a whole number decimal string, so that character-based data, or just a true or false Boolean. I'm going to go and pick a whole number because all of our grades are in whole numbers. Our teachers aren't that pedantic. And then I can go and set a starting value basically. So how mean should I be to our students? And let's say, let's be pretty mean. I'm gonna go and set a passing grade of 85 to see whether our students can go and, and pass when they need to. Now, this is where you've got a little bit of a decision to make in my head around parameters, that are you building this parameter for something that you can do and use within your flow? Or are you building this flow to let your users of your data set go and run different scenarios through? In my head, the parameter is for that end user. It's for somebody using scenarios going, okay, well, I wanna see how many students I need to deal with if we're looking at failing grades when our pass rate is set at 85. Well, if I drop that to 80, how many students does that leave me with and who are those students? Let's go and use their IDs to understand um, which, which subjects they're struggling in or what I might need to do. That's really where the parameter is gonna come in. So I want to really go and point out this box that sits underneath our current values of prompt for value at runtime. What that basically means is when you go and publish your flow to the server uh, or you schedule it, you're gonna get somebody to actually go and enter a value when they press run. So when they're choosing to run the flow, they can go and set up when they actually want that to be and what that value to be. You're, you're nudging your users to do that. The reason why that kind of sits with that end user is otherwise I might just go and put this 85 value in a calculation within a clean step. I'd absolutely want to go and document that clearly with my flow, but I don't necessarily need to use a parameter to do that. Um, I might have that as a set value in my flow. Maybe the parameter makes that a little bit more visible for me. Um, we're going to see that be visible when I press go within prep builder, but we'll also see it on the server when we tick this box, when we don't, that's up to you as a user to go and set that at the top of the screen whenever you want to. 
With our different data types, we have this option. Uh, again, it differs a little bit from Tableau Desktop that we can allow anybody to put in anything. Clearly, you're trusting your users in that case. That's that's always a case of who are your end users? Are they going to be clear on what they're doing and why? Or do you want to set up a list of options? We're talking about numbers here. Clearly, range would be a great thing to have, especially if we get dates further down the line as well. That is in the hands of the prep dev team. We'll see what they come up with for that. I'm going to click on OK. And we can see that we've got a parameter set up that I can go in and edit any point, or I can go and create up create multiple parameters as well. So for now, I'm happy. And just like parameters within desktop, I can go and create calculated fields that start to reference this. So I can go and say, hey, I want to see if my score is greater than or equal to my passing grade. You'll see the word parameter at the end when, let me zoom in just a little bit, when we actually have the parameter just in the calculation uh, on its own, then we can actually go and see that it's that kind of normal purple color we expect to see in Tableau Desktop. So that's where some of that familiarity is coming through. So in this case, my calculation that I'm working through is just whether that, that student has passed that subject or not. I can go and click on save. Saving a new calculation within uh, prep will go and create a new column on the left-hand side of your data set. That's because any columns that I've just changed, I probably want to look at them to see whether they've done what I expect them to do. That's why they move to the left-hand side of your data set. You can always go and change those order, just drag them around in the profile pane or in the data pane down at the bottom. But seeing that effect of the, of the calculation over on the left-hand side just, just helps so you're not scrolling through a really wide data set to understand what's going on. And we can see this profile of the students that have passed. If I click on the true, I expect to get all of those students that have scored 85 and above. That's what we're actually seeing within our uh, profile. And we can see, actually, it's a nice distribution across all of our, our student IDs. So that's helping me understand and set a limit, which I can then make available. So really, where we're making that available is actually within this output. So within the output, I'm going to go and set this up in the way that I would do anything normally. So let me just go and browse my files just so I go and drop this somewhere sensible to delete it in a bit. So let's do the prep tug. And this can be my hyper file output to start to go and drop into my download files. So when I go and run this flow, first of all, when I tick on run the flow, what I'm going to get presented with is, hey, what, what passing grade do I want? Well, actually, maybe I want to set it at 80. Let's go and set that and now go and run that flow. So in that case, when I go to run the flow, I'm saying, no, I don't want my passing grade to be 85. Let's go and set it as 80. Lovely, I've done that. I'll create the hyper file. That's now saved into my downloads. We're all good, nice, quick, and easy. But how do I remember what I've set that parameter to? That could be a little bit frustrating. So actually within your file names, you'll notice as you hover over the file location, so the folder structure, or actually the name of the file, we can actually go and drop in that parameter into our file name. So I think this is a, just a really neat piece that we just, I haven't seen mentioned too deeply. Maybe it's been shared in, the, in a previous user group and I missed that. I have a six month old son, so I haven't been to many of these and I should have done, sorry, Jack and Jenny. Um, but dropping, dropping that parameter into that name of that file will be really useful. So when I choose to go and run that flow, and this time, let's be super nice. We'll set the passing grade at 65. And then I go and run that. There's a little bug that is showing that it's 85 in the hyper file in that, that run. But you'll notice that when we actually go and look at that output file, that 65 parameter is being passed in as that passing score. That's just really nice, neat little touches that's going to make these parameters so much more usable as we, we dive into them and get stuck into them in much more detail. I'm waiting to see what the community comes up with in terms of use cases for this. I'm thinking about splitting flows that I will set a parameter to true false, depending on do I want the things that meet certain conditions or fall out of that. Having that ability to move that around and, and set that up is it's going to make a really big difference into what I can use prep for, but also how much I can drive that experience into my users. Because if I publish this flow to the server and then my users pressing run within the server environment, that's when they're going to get prompted to go and enter those values. You're creating a much richer self-service experience without somebody having to kind of learn how to prepare their own data, first of all, but then clearly it's a prep flow. They can get in hopefully pretty quickly, understand what's going on within it. 
So parameters, it opens the door to so many different options. I can't wait to see what people do with it. I'd love to kind of carry on that conversation, either in the Q&A or as we get stuck into conversations on Twitter or the forums, wherever that may be. Tag me into those things. I, want, I really want to go and see where they go. Now, tiling is a little bit of a different beastie. So if you've been using prep for a while and, and you've kind of had access to some of those latest versions, we've got some kind of neat uh, calculation types that are, are kind of described a little bit differently again than what they were within desktop. If I click on my ellipsis menu, go down to create calculated field, we've not just got our classic calculated field that we expect to go and see that dialog box that I had earlier when I was working with my parameter. This is where we're finding the fact that we can do fixed level of detail calculations now. We can do table calcs like rank. Um, and that's where we can actually now find our tile function as well. These slightly more complicated pieces of functionality, and I'm gonna caveat that in a second, comes from that richness that we've had within Tableau Desktop, the development team are finding a way to go and bring that complexity into a data prep world where we're not controlling things with blue pills and green pills on the screen within desktop. We're not using categorical data and measures in, in quite the same way when we think about the granularity and what we do within data prep. So when I load my tile screen, I, I see something very different. If you haven't used fixed LODs or the rank functions within um, Tableau Prep, then you might not have come across what's classed as the visual editor. We have our normal syntax editor in terms of our calculated field that I created earlier, but here we have this visual editor. And I can go and pick whether I'm descending or ascending, and which metric that I'm actually gonna go and base my tiles on. I can go and pick how many tiles I have. Don't worry, I'm gonna explain what a tile is in a second. I can go and pick what calculation type I'm actually looking to do as well. We'll see the other analytical calcs that we have. And I can add some complexity into this. So overall, if I just want to go and look at my students in deciles, so break everything up or break all of my students into 10 even chunks, uh, we can just go and rename, uh, let's call it decile overall, then we can go and partition those up. So we'll see that scores up to a certain point of who falls into each part. So 96 as a score, well, actually sometimes that leaves you in the, the, the first decile, sometimes that pushes you into the second decile because there's a break point in terms of our, out of our thousand students, the hundred students that score within that range. If I click on done, we'll see the output of this is 10 even sets of rows if everything's worked out correctly, does. And we can see that we've got 700 rows because we've got um, seven different subjects for those hundred students, so 700 rows. So we're, we're finding out how people are distributed across there. If I go and pop out my changes pane, you'll actually see the calculation that Prep's writing. By using that visual editor, we're saving ourselves from having to use this end tile function, set it up in the right way. You know, so my 10 within there is actually me talking about deciles rather than breaking it down by quartiles if it's four, et cetera, or quintiles if it's five. What order we're actually holding that measure against. So our score is in descending order 100 down to the lower scores and setting up that order by et cetera. I can go and write this out by scratch if I want to. So if you prefer that syntax-based way of writing these calculations, there is nothing stopping you. And as Will's coming next as a coder, clearly he does. But for most of us lay people um, who aren't deep, deep, deep into coding, then having this visual editor makes it easier. I'm, I'm also seeing what's going on and those changes that are happening as I go and work with it, that we see that distribution of the data. I can also go and break this down in more detail. Um, so group everything up by subject. So that's where I'll change my calculation name as a good citizen to my decile by subject. So I can see what I'm actually going creating and not going crazy or driving other people crazy. And you'll see that I've now got a partition within there. So I'm creating complicated calculations but in a much cleaner and easier way because we're using the visual editor rather than trusting everybody to have to build that syntax for themselves. So tiles, I'm kind of waiting to see again what use cases people are gonna come up with. Um, I've used Alteryx for years. There is a tile tool within there. There's a couple of ways that I've used it, but it's not something that I kind of had crazy hunger to, to dive into. So if other people have got really good use cases of tiles, I'd love to, I'd love to hear them to see how that functionality is actually going and helping me. 
so they were the main two that um, when I spoke to Jack about, of hey, let's go and look at some of the, the richer new functionality, tiles and parameters are within there. I will quickly mention as, as while we're here about these other analytical calcs. So fixed level of detail calculations, if you're comfortable with using level of detail calculations in desktop, fantastic. If you're not, prep's actually gonna help you do that. I could go and work out my average score by subject. Yes, I could do that in a um, aggregation tool, but the benefit of using a fixed level of detail calculation is I don't have to do the, the rejoin because with an aggregation step, you're gonna go and only look at the thing that you're grouping by or the things that you're grouping by and your aggregation, you lose all the other richness in the data. So if I wanna keep um, that uh, student ID and see which decile they're falling into, I'm not using that within my calculation, but I can see the average score. So actually the hardest um, score to, to get above average is in the sciences, the lowest art, I'm gonna take a guess. I don't know, I made this data up in Mockaroo. <laughs> so it's completely fake data, it's maths, there we go. Um, then we don't have to go and rejoin that data onto itself. So that's where level of detail calculations is really helping out. If I just dive into a calculation really quickly, I'll show you where you can find all of the detail about coding and writing the, the syntax for these calculations. It's under this reference of our analytical functions. And you'll find that we've now got end tile within there, uh, and you'll get a description, an example of how to go and write out those calcs if you want to build it from scratch, if you're trying to do something that's a lot more uh, complicated. But you'll also notice we've got all of our rank functions and also a row number. That row number does need to be ordered by something. So either a numerical, so an order, ordinal field of some kind, possibly an ID, um, or, a data fit, or a date field. You can't just go and hold it against anything. That's one challenge with prep if we've got sucking in data and giving it a row ID right from the word go but that's a much longer and deeper conversation. But row number is in there as well. So those analytical calcs have come in. I'm seeing people save huge amounts of time by doing actually quite complex things in prep rather than pushing that more complicated work into desktop and into that Tableau server source, data source, where you're then kind of asking your users to have that higher level of expertise before they dive into that. Also, while I'm quickly here, I'll, I'll kind of stop after this. One of, the big, one of the big benefits that we're seeing is simplification of what we're doing overall. That's ultimately the aim of prep. So we're seeing this ability to go and break down our date parts very easily. So in this case, I could go and look at the day of the week instead of the date to see when my grades are actually handed out and see when my teachers are working. Are they, are they working at weekends? Are they working during the day uh, on the normal school day? We've got an issue. Lots of our grades are being given out on Saturday. Am I asking too much of my staff? That's going to help me go and understand which subjects that's happening in. Do I even need to go into desktop sometimes is a question I ask myself more. But this is where part of the data preparation flow for me has always been about data exploration, understanding what I need, what questions I might want to ask, and how I'm kind of getting stuck into that more and more and more. And we're not just doing that within Prep Builder. The final piece I'll mention is we actually have the ability to do lots of this in browser now. That was the other big addition that we've seen recently. So in my Tableau server, I can go and click on, let's go and create a new flow. I can go and connect to data. We've got lots of our normal connections. Clicking on our text file, I can go and grab that grades data. I would do if it just didn't magically disappear. That grades data, upload that. You'll see it uploads in a few seconds. And look, I'm pretty much on the same screen, but this is all in my server. So I now have prep in browser to go and do all of that rich work that I did before. I've just got the power of the server sitting behind it. All of those normal steps exist. You'll be matching your different bits of functionality based on that version of the server or Tableau Online. You can actually have quite a lot of fun with this without having to distribute Prep Builder to all of those individual users. So at that point, I'm going to stop. I know that was a little bit of a whistle stop. I knew the recording was there. So hopefully you can fall back on that if you missed any of those little subtle pieces that I went through. The Prep devs are giving us loads of great stuff and, and loads of great stuff rapidly. Um, so keep in touch with those how-to posts. Hopefully there you find them useful. Let me know if you do, because it kind of gives me a bit more motivation to keep up to date a bit more, um, especially with that six month old, slowly ebbing my life away from me. But actually it's kind of, it's fun still using prep as, as those new tools are making people's lives easier and taking a lot of work out. So I am now going to stop and uh, take some questions.
Thank you very much, Carl. So we have had a few questions dropped into the chat. So one of them is around with the parameters. How does um, prep conductor handle the, pr the prompt to input that parameter value when you're running it on server? So if, if you're running it as a run now, that's where you're getting that, um, that dialog box pop up to actually go and handle that. If you've got it as a scheduled task, it's just going to go and pick the latest value. It's not going to sit there and wait for you to like, come in at 9 a.m. and enter that value before it carries on. Um, so, so that's what I've seen so far. I haven't done a huge amount of testing around that, um, but, but that, was the, that was the original way that I've seen it designed. Um, but yeah, without using it against too many different data sources, I'm, I'm still expecting that behavior to be exactly that. So is it, do you have a default value or is it the last run value? It's the last run value, so it's whatever you've you've put into it, probably as the author until it's been changed um, by somebody else. How how that persists and does that persist post uh, server refresh and everything else gets into versioning? Um, that's where I haven't kind of dived too deeply into the testing. So um, I'll set that as homework for you, Jack, to to try and work that out. Um, but yeah, no, it's there's. That's really why that tick box is there. Are you prompting your user to want to, to go and ask that question as they run it? Or do you just assume that they want to pick up whatever value you've chosen? Cool. cool. Yeah, moving on from that, um, there was a question more in the chat uh, rather than the Q&A, but saying about the prep parameter feature and how is it different from a filter in a workbook? Um, if you can just explain that again, uh, the, yeah, the user can change the filter values um, from a downloaded data from the view, but yeah, if you can just clarify. I, I got, ultimately, it comes down to lots of different facets. We, we know data is a big, diverse beast that sometimes those data sets are huge. And I think most of us who have ever worked in a big corporate know the laptops aren't that powerful. You've got a couple of semi-geriatric hamsters that are trying to run on the little wheel to power it for you. It, they don't all work that well. If you work in a corporate where you do have a good laptop, I'm just jealous. Um, so in those situations, cutting down data is a really important piece that helps your users focus on what they're trying to do. Um, and sometimes it makes the data usable where it hasn't been previously. So that, that's the use cases where you're asking specific questions of the data that might change and help your user to narrow that focus. It, it's probably as similar to a data source filter within desktop. Uh, you're, you're trying to nudge people in that direction a little bit more. There will be loads of things around permissioning that I think we could do with clever things. Um, at the same time as almost picking which output do I want to deal with right now. So we're gonna almost set up, I can imagine some rule-based elements to, to lead to the, the output that you're looking for, because it's not just necessarily setting one parameter, you could set multiple parameters. So it, it's absolutely, could you deal with filters? Yeah, for the moment, but it's a, it depends at the same time as to, to whether you want your users to do that, whether they're allowed to have the permission to do that, sometimes whether they have the skill to do that. I know I'm saying that about filters, but I've, I've used prep or devs uh, tabloid for 10 years now. I've seen some pretty interesting use cases and struggles from people. I think ultimately that's where it's going to come down to as those different use cases, they bubble up. This, this feels like a starting place rather than the final solution. But I, I do see a lot of use cases out there. Um, ultimately, should the work be done in desktop versus should the work be done in prep is a big, long debate to have. And the, there are so many facets that go into that in terms of the skill set of your users, data quality, data security, all of those data signs. Um, that's probably a whole different prep user group. Maybe that's what Jack will invite me back to, to talk about for the fourth time that I attend the prep user group. Oh, don't know. There's a, a limit at three. Oh, there you go. I hit my limit. <laughs> Joking, of course not. Um, there's a good question from Stephen about whether you can, I, I didn't know about that being able to put the parameter into the file name, um, mm. which is really nice. But Stephen asking about, is there any way you can sort of have a like runtime date also in the file name? I was, no, because it's parameter driven at the moment. Yeah. Um, it's, it's something that I would definitely love to see happen. Ultimately, you could have a column that just has the now or today function, depending on how accurate you want to be with that runtime within the data set. I think there's a wider debate and discussion around what metadata would you like the, the files that prep 
creates to have that that seems to be something that we've not got too deeply into yet i say we i'm not a developer i just use the thing um i, I think that is definitely one area where i'd love to see more developments happen so completely agree Stephen. that definitely see some great use cases for that and directions of where that could go but no not yet because that parameter although you can set any value unless you're typing that date and time in yourself no that's that's not going to be possible and you can't use dates at the moment you have to do it with numbers which would get entirely weird i was going to say maybe one way in the future is if they bring in date values to the parameter you you have a date value but maybe there's a default to run it as today and then that's one way it could be fed in but no dates for now okay. cat based parameters yeah. jenny are we going for? <laughs> yes yes yeah. Pira is just so excited by your parameter chat. Um, <laughs> so I've got another question for you here around tiles. Um, mm -hmm. So if you wanted to separate the students into 10 randomized groups, could tiles do that? Or does it have to be based on a variable in the data set? Theoretically, you could create a random number and then allocate the, the tiles based on that column instead. So mm. yes, you could do that, but random does slash doesn't exist depending on your data source that you're using um as we've found over time within prep uh so yeah it's not a supported calculation function random so that's hard to do but there are ways to go and create random calculations and there's some interesting posts i've seen over the years on that so yes you could use that column to then do the tiles based on that so yeah that would be a way to work around that that feels like a prep and data challenge that we should write at some point. Mm, yeah, I did, I did think that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question, whoever that was. Cool. Uh, one quick one um, as well about the version of prep, the exact version you were using. I know it's 20 to 21.4, but do you know what the point after it was? I think point three off the top of my head. Let me check and check. Oh, it was, yeah, 21.4.3 on the map if that helps as well cool i think that that's the majority of questions answered um there's a more general prep question here that wasn't necessarily related um but it's been asked a couple of times about um if you can set up say hierarchies in prep that you would use in desktop and like um put the fields into folders more kind of documentation um side of data sources yeah, that, that's, that's that metadata that I talk about that would be great to pass hierarchies and formats and uh, even things like percentage columns, actually formatting that number as a percentage or the aggregation setting those default properties. Not possible within prep at the moment. Absolutely would love it to be. And it, it's something I keep nudging the devs when they talk to me um, about. Um, Pira clearly seems to want that those, those that functionality too. Um, so, so absolutely yes, I would I would love to have that, but not at the moment, unfortunately. Okay, great. Keep voting up on the ideas for it. Yeah, is all I'll yeah. say to that. Mm. Okay, cool. Um, I think that that's all the questions that we can see. Can you say any more, Jack? That you think would be good to get answered. Um. There's one about address standardization, but I think the quick answer is no. <laughs> address standardization such as 123 East River Fool Drive becomes 123 E River Fools DR. So, so you can set custom data roles, but you basically have to program all of those potential variables yourself. So you're reading really potentially reading that in as a file to, to do a join against is the way that I would describe that. I think the join version of that rather than data custom data role version of that would be easier to do. No, not natively easier. Um, spatial elements haven't really come into prep too much yet. And, and again, we've had some long discussions between various groups of if spatial comes in, then surely you'd want to see the mapping element of that within prep instead of just the profile paint potentially. Um, so that feels like some much bigger builds. I'd love it if it happened, but but I haven't seen or heard those yet. And I don't, I'm not privy to those actual conversations of the team doing that. Um, I think that's where those kind of functionality would come in if you were matching that a bit more deeply. Great. Well, thank you very much.
um, for presenting once again. Uh, it's great to have you back. Uh, I know you do have to drop off for another presentation, but um, thank you. And we'll see you soon. That's all right. Thank you guys for having me. And um, I'll leave you in the Will's very capable hands. Perfect. So you should just be able to share your screen, Will. Um, there you go. Perfect. Is that, is that working? Yep, that's working. Okay. Cool. Thank you all for letting me get the chance to talk. Uh, I'm Will. I put together this little presentation called Prepped for Success, uh, which is about exploring the role of data prep for data visualization and how we can make this more of an efficient workflow. Uh, as Carl outed me earlier, I am a coder, so I have very limited Tableau prep experience, but I've tried to make this presentation sort of quite general, like tool agnostic. So hopefully there's some value regardless of what tool you're using. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, so I'm Will Sutton. I'm a senior data analyst at a company called World Remit, which is a company supporting migrants and sending money home to their families. Uh, so it's founded on that principle. So for example, my wife is from Malaysia. Uh, she can go and send money back home uh, to Malaysia using our app. Uh, previously, uh, I've been in all kinds of different industries. So I was at the BBC for four years in broadcast media, very different data challenges. I started off before then in financial research where I met this little tool called Tableau that changed everything for me uh, and initially I started off as in stockbroking of all places and I added that one in because it was pretty much a, a data prep challenge we were looking up uh, client account numbers to then work out what investments they should have in their portfolio so that was an early introduction mostly with Excel uh, but yes I am largely a coder I've been using SQL on Python for around about seven years uh, but I did also make my first prep flow about two weeks ago. So I am, uh, I feel like I've learned a lot, certainly from Carl's talk earlier, but uh, again, this is part of it. You don't have to be an expert to give a presentation here. I also am quite active in the Tableau community. I particip participate in a lot of community challenges such as Iron Quest, Sports with Sunday, and of course, prepping data. Uh, it then led me to go and Develop my own community project called Games Night Viz, which I co-host with Tina and Lewis. And this is a data visualization, design, and prep challenge because I couldn't really decide which one I wanted to do more. I thought they were all great, valuable pieces to learn, but it uses uh, data from different games. So this is looking at data from, say, poker players to Jeopardy to Mario. So loads of different opportunities and great fun. And it's really interesting to see the work that people produce with this project. So do check us out if you've got some spare time. Uh, in my spare time, I'm actually quite active in uh, a running club uh, out here in West London uh, called West Four Harriers. This is a little picture of us uh, last Saturday. Uh, for those in the UK, you know, there was a storm Eugen Eugene's on. And this is us charging headfirst into wind and hail. And I've got to say that was probably the, uh, the driest part of the course. It was just incredibly muddy since then. So that's a little bit about me. Let's get on to what, I'm, what the talk is about today. So I, I believe when we sort of think about this sort of workflow for data viz, we generally get a request through or we have an idea of something that we want to build. We then go away and put together a data set which we then go and turn into a visualization. But how many times have you been in the situation where actually you've got to the visualization stage and then you actually need to go back to the data set to either add something new in, change something, make some fields easier or restructure the data so you can make some new charts. So what I've, what I've done is I've tried to, with this talk, try to establish a time efficient workflow for data prep to data viz. I've gone around, I've asked people in the community at work for their advice on this. So I've installed a lot of their tips and tricks throughout this presentation. And what I would say from, from reading all the comments is that everyone does this in a kind of different way. Uh, and I think it's sort of native to if you feel whatever you do feels best, but I would certainly use this presentation to reflect on how you prepare data for visualization and any like tips you may want to adopt from this talk. because. So from seeing Carl walk through data, uh, Tableau Prep, there's a lot more visual aspects going on there that you may want to do first in Tableau Prep versus the tool. So 
I would start off, I would say the first thing that I always try to look for uh, when putting together data visualization is to find a purpose. Uh, it feels quite philosophical, but it's trying to set a direction for your data and what problem you're trying to solve with your visualization. So it breaks down if it, from what I've seen in terms of a story to tell. So it's largely what story do you want to tell and who do you want to listen to that story? So in terms of your story, this can be part of your request where you say for management, they want to understand what sales performance has been. They want to know how compared the product is or the typical interview question. Just here's some data. Can you just share some insights from it? And this is these requests come in. And it's all about understanding the factors that are of interest to your target audience. But then similarly with your target audience, it's about understanding what type of visual would work for them. So Joe from my, my company talks about, do you want to put together a single tool or something interactive for them? What kind of later, how technical can they use this work and where is it going to end up? So it's putting together in a format that your audience could use and these things come together and it's all about connecting with your audience. One tip we got from Twitter uh, from Mathias with the cool, cool lettering, uh, which I agree with like completely has been throughout a lot of my visual work is asking questions. So Mathias talks about asking business colleagues what answers they need for their questions. And this I found has been really helpful for me in terms of finding a direction for visualization. I'll give you an example, which is back in July of last year, I was watching the Tour de France and it looked pretty intense, but I've seen some old these old pictures you see on the left of where it's very limited days, very simple equipment, muddy roads, uphill, uh, very different, looks very challenging race. But then you also have more recent events where actually it's a lot more popular events, a lot more strategy involved, a lot more better equipment. Uh, but you also have this, this issue, I think, if anyone saw last year's tour or just the clip, you will notice that you remember this uh, spectator who then caused a, a quite big crash early on into the race. Uh, we're causing a number of people to drop out. So my question was around which one was really the toughest? Is it the old days or is it the newer days where actually technologies and popularity is causing some issues? So then when I broke down what that toughness word was, it's a very high subjective kind of term. It's not really one metric couldn't really fit at all. So I put together multiple metrics to score each of the tours for. So it was understanding the race and that there was differences in terms of distance, in terms of pace, how high elevation the tour reached, how many people abandoned the race. There's some races where loads of people didn't make it through the race, just gave up uh, for right or wrong. <laughs> Uh, which then became a very like good direction for me to go out and find this data, put it together in a data set and then build it into a data visualization that way. And that was a nice way for me to sort of be a bit more direct with the visual I was trying to create. So I've seen many sort of great Tour de France visits before, but uh, this was really uh, helped me break through what I was going to do with the data. So next up is, to, is about for taking an initial look with the data. So you can dive into the data set with a data viz tool, or in this case, I mentioned you, you could do quite a bit in Tableau prep as well. Uh, so when I was asking the question, the very range of ideas of what you can do of getting a first impression with the data. Uh, so Elisa talks about skimming the data, getting acquainted with it. So it's about getting familiar with the data. Priya talks about uh, where do you want to get to? What's your end goal? And similarly, Gwen from my office also talks about sketching it out, you know, what you want to visualize at the end of it. So getting towards that end goal, what it looks like. And Dahl also talks about the current structure of the data. What does it look like at the moment? So for me, I would also like agree with these totally, but I would also add two more, uh, which is firstly, check the accuracy of the data. We don't always have like perfect data sources or we can sometimes have multiple sources for the same answer. But it's a good point just to check that the numbers you're looking at at the moment make sense uh, and how they compare against similar pieces of work that have been done before. I would say definitely do this early because I've done it before where you've gone all the way to the end, you've got your visualization ready and uh, the numbers don't match. And then you have to go all the way back and that can be uh, quite time consuming. 
also I say is this is like an initial look with in Tableau or database tool. It's about reducing the amount of data you actually put in. Just you're just trying to get a play around with the data. So if you are have got a large data set, say millions of rows, you can just reduce that down. Just take say a few weeks or so data, just so you can get enough to get comfortable with it. See what see what's there and see how it looks. Next, so we come into the structure. So you've got this, this visual plan in mind. You've just now got it converted into a data set. So you've gone from this concept drawing, you've, you've sketched it out. You then want to go on and say, understand whether you have all the columns for your dimensions and metrics. Is everything in the same place, like in a consistent way? So, well, all the countries in the same country column and can you filter down from one to the other? And, doesn't return the data you'd expect. And part of, I think a large part of this for me is actually, can you build all the charts you need from the data set with relative ease? Uh, there's a lot of like, oh, the data's ready, but if you have to then go and build a lot of calculations, the calculated fields to get to the, get to the charts you want, it feels like there's a bit of uh, time that could be saved there on the Tableau side. And I think, from, from my side, like the classic example of where we all first think, oh, we need to do some more data prep is the measure names, measure values uh, setup. So for those who aren't familiar, if you have, say, a wide data set, you have many different metrics across, you can just pull them into a Tableau, into a visual using measure names, and then measure values will come up and you'll get every single value. And it's in a quick and easy table, or you can make some small, interesting charts. The trouble is then, if you want to build any more interactivity on that table, it becomes quite challenging. I'm not sure it can be done in most cases, but I just kept it open. Uh, so if you want to say filter for say profit here, that's going to be a challenge. Or say if you want to show the sales over time as like a vision tool tip, that's, that's much more of a challenge. So NER here recommends converting, unpivoting the multiple measures. So you unpivot the data so you convert all those additional columns into a row and that will allow you to unlock this interactivity much easier more with twitter we've got back to some more great ideas which is about at this stage with the structure you know you've got your end goal you've got your viz we like plan in mind and then you've got a specific set of dimensions and metrics to work on so Sean recommends here is understanding what each row of the data represents. So what ones, what can you say about one single row? Like this is one customer transaction. This is one um, customer ID metadata description. Assuming with uh, Stefan, he talks about any duplicates in the data to try and get that clean data set built up. Tanya has some great uh, responses as well around Put, whether you have a data dictionary to help understand, making the data squeaky clean uh, and filling any inconsistencies there. And this is all about, so you've reduced down to your goal and you're building a clean data set to get to. I'd say lastly, uh, for my side, is that it, just, it doesn't have to be just one data set. Uh, so when I was putting together my visual for the Iron Viz 2022, uh, it was around interpreting pictures. So you had a quiz where you had to answer what you thought the different images were. This came back as this, uh, this data set on the left. And I actually decided that it was easier for me to make this into small individual data sets that each did different purpose in the visual. So you'd one that just showed what the overall responses were for each question down to a much more granular uh, version where it was designed for a Sankey chart where you had the full path of each one. And that was purely for a lot of handling several calculated fields in one data set. I just split it up. So it was actually quite simple when it actually came to building to put this together. And I was able to link between the data sets with parameters and parameter actions if I needed to as well. Okay, number four, uh, we're on to prototyping. So you've got this structure of a data set together. This is about building a quick early viz to get some feedback on. So say this is an example of a viz I put together a while ago. And it's just asking, I think, members close to you in your organization or not quite your audience, intended audience, but can they actually understand it as it is at the moment? And they, 
get a second pair of eyes on the data as well as what else would they add? Because it's often like when they see it in the actual form that they can actually suggest a lot of other things that you may not have seen initially. And I think when it's in this visual form, it's quite helpful to interact with. So this isn't about doing loads of formatting or anything. This is just pulling something together quite quickly uh, just to get some early feedback on it, just in case uh, there's something you can change. And then you just take away and just iterate on that feedback and make any changes that need be. Lastly is around getting stakeholder ready. So you've got like a prototype little viz together, you've got some feedback on it. And now it's just enriching that data set to be, be a bit more accessible for your intended audience and to build a bit of trust as well. Uh, so for this section, I talk about actually two great talks from last year's Tableau conference and I definitely recommend watching these if you can. Uh, so Michelle talked about building trust around users. So if you have, say, your KPI, so you are talking about how much, how many emails are opened as a percentage, you could show, say, in the tooltip or something, uh, this number of opens divided by the number of sales and see how that trends over time. And so stakeholders can then understand which, what is changing with that metric, that KPI as well. Is it that they're sending out more communications or that actually the ones they are sending are getting are more likely to be opened as well? And similarly, if you have, say, that big number of like, oh, sales were X million at the moment, is providing that additional context as well. Is, is that good? Maybe this is sort of explaining where, say, the target is or budget is uh, for this figure as well. Uh, so providing that extra bit of context, that extra work, like that polish to make it stakeholder friendly. And lastly, Emily talks about this sort of making the dashboard a bit more informative, engaging and accessible. And I think this is one of the more difficult stages of getting to understand the audience a bit more and iterating on our feedback. And I think this slowly comes over time, but I think the reason why this is quite important, even though it's quite far away from the initial data we prepped, is that if this dashboard gets adopted, we're less likely to receive this uh, request again back in the future. So actually you save yourself quite a long time, uh, time saver on data prep tasks in the future if you have something already. And I definitely would advise iterating on something uh, with, the state, with the stakeholders in mind so you can continually build on something, slowly understand how they work. You then get to a point where you actually understand something that works for them and then can build much more towards that, that additional model so you understand how much extra work is going to be involved in terms of getting the viz to a standard that they're going to need to use. Okay, that's been quite a, like a whistle stop tour. Uh, so just to recap on the journey we've been on. So on data, viz, uh, data prep to data flow, uh, it's about finding a purpose. What questions do you want to get answered? Uh, what questions are interesting to your stakeholders? Uh, next, I would say take an initial, initial look at the data, either Tableau prep, Tableau, uh, Tableau desktop itself, get familiar with the data and start sketching out that plan of how you want the data to look. Structure your data set. So thinking about how you're gonna make these charts super easy to build, how you can build in interactions quite, quite swiftly and that they're gonna work and you're not gonna to have to write too much, too many calculated fields or parameter actions or something. Uh, next, get that, uh, you work on that prototype so you can build a basic viz for your teammate or colleague to get feedback on, then you can iterate. And then lastly, you've the last mile of getting that uh, that viz to a stakeholder ready format so that you can enrich the prototype to make that more accessible for them uh, so they can go and use it and adopt it. And then you won't have to revisit this data prep challenge in the future. So that that is all for me, a quick run through. I uh, just want to say a big thank you for letting me talk. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'm available on Twitter, jo join in the conversation, and you can find my work, Tableau Public, GitHub. And also, if you're interested in Games Night Viz, just, just search for Games Night Viz on Twitter. You'll surely find all the resources there as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Will. Um, I really enjoyed not just hearing from you, but everyone else on there. Uh, tips for data prep. So I definitely have a couple of questions. Um, so you were saying about um, kind of putting the calculations uh, into the data prep stage rather than having them all in Tableau. 
Um, and do you have kind of a set rule for that? Um, if you're kind of working in Tableau, do you think, oh, I should go back to the um, data preparation phase? Like if you realize you need additional calcs or do you kind of, is it a bit more flexible? It's definitely flexible. I would say uh, I generally would try and write like a little list of things I need to go back and fix. And sometimes you get to a native stage where you feel like, this is far too complicated. You know, if you're sort of wading through uh, level detail calculations, et cetera, et cetera, and it's becoming a bit too hard, yeah, uh, definitely pull that out to the data prep stage. And I'd also advise if you are running into performance issues, it's always good to just reel it out uh, into data prep, make sure there's a specific field or column for that. And then uh, your visits will run nice and smoothly. Yeah, that's definitely true. I, I definitely let a few. Uh calc sneak through until it's a problem and then i'm like okay <laughs> yeah, i'm absolutely. going back <laughs> we, we all learn the hard way i think is, yeah. is the main thing and that's that's what this process is all about it's about learning when to do what so yeah definitely definitely um and then i had another question um about i saw someone mentioning sort of the data model earlier and um how that kind of interacts with data prep because obviously um you're kind of making relationships with the data model but in data prep you're kind of making those uh physical joins um so kind of weighing up when to use watch which um i know you kind of touched on it with your iron biz um one but yeah what's your thoughts on it um generally try and keep data uh any joins i always try and keep away from tableau if possible uh always make sure i do all that kind of calculation work outside of the tool so really i see tableau is it's all picking the right tool for the job. Uh, Tableau can do it, but I could also paint my house with a hammer. It probably doesn't make much sense. Uh, so I generally try and stick all Tableau just to do majority of visualization work and any calculations if I really need to. Uh, and then I'd move all those joins outside uh, to form the data set. Uh, but similarly, there are other, other options, as I mentioned, you could build simpler data sets and link them with a parameter, which is quite a nice new feature. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, uh, is there any other questions that we have for Will? Do you have any, Jack? I don't, <clears throat> but that was a really interesting presentation, so thank you for coming along. Um, if anyone does have any, shout. I can see a couple of comments just saying it's really useful to hear people have the, sim the same struggles. Um, you're not alone out there. Yeah, I'm absolutely. The same process. Yeah, um, I think that comment from Josh about there being no magic bullet there isn't really it's a lot of it depends and <laughs> yeah um, yeah I mean you find yourself giving that answer to questions in this field all the time of it depends <laughs> um it's very true but yeah if there aren't any other questions thank you so much Will um, no problem thank you guys for cool. inviting me along <laughs> there has just been one question added <laughs> to the Q&A um I'll, I'll read this out. So I often, so it's from um, Hattice. Uh, I often adjust original data first, such as adding new columns, then put it through prep or desktop, but then have to repeat periodically. Um, any suggestions? I think that's probably the best way to go. I think if you have it in a manageable way and it works, I think the, the real struggle I have sometimes in terms of time wasting is when you have too many columns and you're trying to figure out which one is which in Tableau. Uh, so if anything, it's trying to understand which ones don't I need sometimes. And I suppose you could remove that at the data prep stage just to try and make that actual layout and build version that much easier. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I agree there. Um, and it's always an iterative process. It's not just linear. No, <laughs> it's no. always a bit of going backwards and forwards. <laughs> that's okay there is one question in the chat about what's the best way to handle time values in prep um do you want to have a go at that jenny uh the best way to handle time values in prep i would say is to make them a date time uh data type um because although you may not need the date part if it's the same date across uh all of them, then that's probably the best way to handle them. Uh, and then you say date diff functions will work with all the time value uh, date parts as well. Um, is that a useful answer? <laughs> um, yes. Yep, brilliant, cool. Um, 
And could you just quickly explain, Will, you mentioned data dictionaries. Could you explain what a data dictionary oh, is? Yes, we probably should. Uh, so data dictionary will be, say, uh, just a lookup, like in a normal dictionary, if you're looking up a word, in this case, you could look up a metric or a field, and there would be a brief explanation of it. Um, so, so in my company at the moment, we talk a lot about transactions. So it'd be explaining what a transaction is in the data. Um, very useful things to have. Very mm. stakeholders usually invariably ask about these things. So. Yeah, definitely something that becomes really commonplace to you. Like I think of the acronyms that just get thrown around uh, oh. that you just look at something and you're like, what is this? Yes. And that's <laughs> it's something really simple. Yeah. And that, that's the part, I suppose, as well as getting more people around it, because you make up your own acronym sometimes, you think everybody else knows it. And certainly mm -hmm. for me, coming new to some of these different organizations, I was like, what does this even mean? I've never heard, <laughs> like, even like acronyms or just general language they have there. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we've got another question. So with your background in coding, do you have difficulties with creative storytelling in your visits? I hear it's a common struggle with coders and analytics types from Jeffrey. Uh, do I have, I suppose I actually have quite an art background as well. <laughs> so back in the day, I was a bit more prolific with art, but it stopped since university. So um, I don't have too many problems. I find I'm like one of those creative kind of people where I have more ideas than I could possibly implement so and part of this I suppose is just taking a bit of inspiration for what's around you I suppose like for example the Iron Viz submission I put together I, I generally as I say not very keen on putting together a visual about art but this was for me the most funny thing that stood out for me of like a project to do these images if you have seen the Viz uh are very questionable about what they are and the fact that this was made by one of my family members i think even more funny to me so in that sense i just i suppose creatively thought oh wouldn't that be cool if that was a visual uh, i suppose that's where i get this whole creative spark from sometimes just asking that question i suppose is a good good starting point yeah definitely from the more uh i have like a mathematical background and i wouldn't say that i'm particularly uh, artistic and sometimes I do feel my design isn't that inspired, um, but equally um, in the business context, you're not often asking for the most beautiful. You're kind of just asking for what's going to clearly communicate this. And sometimes you can go down a bad path if you're trying to make something beautiful. The kind of first step is like make it insightful and understandable. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely register with getting the story right because I suppose like if you look back on my Tableau public profile, it wasn't always artistic at all. It was here's a bar chart done. Um, yeah. yeah, I did slowly learn this over time. There's sort of principles of design you can implement. I've put together actually a couple of tutorials on Tableau public for that. Uh, so you can always check those out. But yeah, it's it's another skill I had to learn like as well well of doing this. And a lot of it is seeing things that are out there that appeal mm. to you, look good, look clean, and think, oh, how do they put that together? Uh, so it is, uh, what was the term, steal like an artist, I think is definitely true. So, but always at attribute as well. Um, definitely. And then one point, I keep saying one final question. They just keep popping up though. <laughs> like, it's like Columbo, if you ever remember that program, just one more thing. Just one more. Um, can you explain what you meant um, when you were saying uh, mentioning those uh, joins that you do do in Tableau and then using a parameter. Um, what what did you mean? How, how was the parameter coming into that? Okay, so I think it's more of a specific case for the iron viz I was putting together was that um, if I wanted to do any interactivity, I could do it via parameter actions and then link that to this different data sets. I didn't need to say join, say if you have a dimension in one data set, join that across to the other data sets involved. Does that make sense? So as in like inputting them as separate data sources, yep. not kind of using the data source pane modeling at all, just no. separate data sources, a parameter that links them. Yeah, and they, so they wouldn't talk to each other in a join format. Mm. It would just be the parameter that just updates. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, let us know, Dorothy, if that makes sense for you. Okay, I think I think we have done the questions. 
Um, I will answer that um, final question from you, Alejandro, in a second. Um, but other than that, thanks very much, Will. And I'll hand back to you, Jack, for wrapping up. Sure. Um, yeah, so thanks for joining everyone. Um, we This will be posted on um, Tableau's YouTube channel tomorrow. Uh, it should go out. And we'll, we'll let you know um, over email that it has done uh, with a link. I know people have asked for the slides from the presenters. Um, we don't have a really easy means of doing this just because of how the promotion of these events are done. What I can do is um, get the slides from Will and Carl. Um, I can put them on a Tableau community forums post, and then I can link that to you in the email that will go out afterwards. Um, so just keep your eyes out for that. Should go out tomorrow sometime. Um, but yeah, otherwise, thanks for coming. Um, the next session is actually planned. I can tell you the date. Very organized this time around. Um, it is 21st of April. The 21st of April, yep. Yeah. yeah. 21st of April. Um, that will be for sort of EMEA and then going east, so towards APAC. Um, it starts early morning in the UK and then, you know, move throughout the day, depending on where you're based. So if you are dialing in from America, um, that will be one to catch up on uh, on recording, unless you do fancy joining in the middle of the night. But um, I would assume probably not. Uh, and we'll, we'll try or Remo at that event. Um, so there'll be a bit more of that virtual networking. Um, we can see how that goes and collect some feedback on that as well. But um, yeah, otherwise, thanks for joining. Have a great rest of your days and see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.